Good evening, everyone. What a great joy and privilege to be here with all of you, bishops and priests, religious, deacons, seminarians, faithful, and, and for all of us, it's an immense consolation to have so many young Catholics here tonight. We're also very pleased and humbled to be able to welcome the Orthodox Metropolitans, bishops, and clergy who are also joining us here at the Basilica. This year, we are saddened that Nellie Gray is not with us, as she has been for the last 40 years. I call her the Joan of Arc of the Gospel of Life. As a young priest working here at the Spanish Catholic Center in Washington, when I heard about Nellie, who had left her career as a lawyer, like the apostles leaving their boats and nets, to embrace a special vocation to work on behalf of pre-born children. It was my privilege those 40 years ago to help organize the first marches and be with Nellie in so many meetings. She'd always feed us peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And she was an inspiration to myself and to countless others. And surely she continues to pray for us from her place in eternity. We all owe her a, an enormous debt of gratitude, and tonight we lift her up in prayer in this Eucharist, which she loved so much. I'm always a little surprised when I'm invited to preach here you see, many years ago as a young priest, I was preaching at a big mass in St. Matthew's Cathedral. It was the Independence Day for Argentina during a very difficult period of their history. I was speaking on John Paul II's teachings on human rights, and suddenly the whole congregation got up and left during the homily. Instinctively, I knew that 900 people were not going to the restroom at the same time. I was, of course, very concerned what the Archbishop would do with me. When the affair was reported to Cardinal Baum, he said, whenever Friar Sean preaches in one of our churches, I want the collection taken up before the gospel. <laughs> it would appear that no one has warned them here tonight since the collection has not yet been taken up. Today's gospel, the second joyful mystery of the rosary, is a great pro-life gospel where two expectant mothers appear together filled with radiance and faith and life. St. Elizabeth reports that John the Baptist leaps for joy in her womb when he hears Mary's words. John dances like David dancing before the ark. And we too rejoice at Mary's words. In the gospel, Mary's first word is fiat. Her first word is yes. Mary is saying yes to God, yes to life, yes to love, and yes, even to the cross. When God was knocking on the door of humanity, it was Mary who said yes in our name and opens that door so that God can come into our world. The last words of Mary recorded in the gospel are those spoken at the wedding feast of Cana. Do whatever he tells you. They're the words I have written on my bishop's ring. Mary's last word is telling us to say yes to God, to life, and to love. The gospel of life is an imperative 
for Christ's disciples. Christ, through his church, is urging us to be defenders of life in the midst of a culture of death. The term culture of death, coined by John Paul II, is an accurate description of the drift of Western culture. Just last week, the newspapers reported a case of euthanasia in Belgium. Twin brothers, Mark and Eddie Verbessem, who were born deaf, were recently diagnosed with glaucoma, which could eventually lead to blindness. Judging their future to be too burdensome, they presented themselves at the University Hospital in Brussels, and the 45-year-old brothers were both given lethal injections. We recently managed to defeat a ballot initiative in Massachusetts that would have legalized physician-assisted suicide. The initial polls had us losing 70% to 30%. But thanks to the power of prayer, so many rosaries, hard work, and alliances with the broad coalition of hospice, healthcare workers, faith groups, disabilities people, Catholic colleges, our Knights of Columbus councils, and our priests and parishioners, along with very aggressive advertising, we actually won. It was like the race between... It was like the race between the tortoise and the hare, and in our race we were the turtle that beat the rabbit. There is no doubt, however, that the next major assault on the gospel of life will come from those pushing physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia, a society that allows parents to kill their children will allow children to kill their parents. During the past 40 years, pro-life Americans have felt the frustration of being disenfranchised by an activist Supreme Court which has denied us the right to vote about abortion. Nevertheless, pro-life act activists have not ceased to wage a campaign of moral suasion on campuses, workplaces, and neighborhoods. It's amazing to think that there are tens of thousands of volunteers working in some 3,000 pregnancy help centers that have provided millions of women in difficult pregnancies with invaluable help, medical, material, and spiritual. Forty years ago, when the Supreme Court handed down the second Dred Dot Scott decision that renders unborn children unprotected by the Constitution of the United States, like people of African-American descent in the days of slavery. Since 1973, there have been about 55 million abortions. That's how many people live in Italy, the United Kingdom, or France. On an average, a quarter of all pregnancies in the United States end in abortion. However, a study in New York City last year shows that the abortion rate in New York City is actually 40% of the pregnancies and that 60% of black children are aborted there. The same study, however, shows a solid consensus that voters were not only shocked by the number of abortions, but they also opposed taxpayers funding abortions and favored parental consent laws, waiting periods, and accurate information about abortion procedure and options. The same poll indicated that 70% of New Yorkers favored conscience rights for health care workers. And I believe that this poll reflects the pulse of the majority of Americans. Sadly, the government is not listening to the people. So now also, we face a grave challenge to religious liberty with the health care mandate 
that redefines religious institutions in a way that hinders our ability conti to continue the valuable services that the church offers to the greater community. Conscience rights and religious exemptions have been important features of our American democracy that has from the beginning valued religious freedom and authentic pluralism with a strong society based on solid families and committed marriages. We have been wandering in the desert for 40 years, but you know, we are getting closer to the promised land. Austin Ivory has put it very well. He says, the direction of Western culture, indelibly marked by Christianity, is moving toward the eventual revelation of the humanity of the victim. Just as the voices of the slave, the ostracized foreigner, the battered housewife, the disabled, the child abuse victim have all eventually been heard, so will eventually the voice of the literally voiceless, the unborn child. As the latest issue of Time magazine states, the vast majority of Americans are opposed to the abortion policies as they exist and would favor limitations. The most encouraging fact, of course, is that younger Americans are more pro-life than ever. Pro-choice activists insist that the abortion question is inherently a religious one and therefore safely beyond serious philosophical reflection or public debate. We hear Catholic politicians saying that they're not in favor of abortion but do not want to impose their religious views on others in a pluralistic society. But abortion, like slavery, is not just a religious issue it's a human rights issue. And it's so evident that our country, where society has become more secular and far more socially liberal on a large range of issues, but the opposition to abortion is growing, including among, among younger Americans who tend to be more liberal on other issues. And although 75% of Americans believe that abortion is the taking of a human life. To change the public attitudes of support for abortion as a necessary evil will require educating Americans about abortion's impact on women and changing attitudes toward adoption. Too many Americans see abortion as a necessary evil. We need to educate the public on the damage done to women by abortion and show that abortion is not a necessary evil but simply evil. Increasingly, studies reveal the harm done to women as well as men who suffer remorse for many years. The abortion option is often used as a fulcrum to push women to do away with their children the Medical Science Monitor reported that 64% of American women who abort feel pressure to do so. The doctors, boyfriends, and insurers all have their reason to push abortion. The boyfriend prefers paying for the procedure rather than providing child support, and if the woman refuses his generous offer to underwrite the abortion and instead gives birth, well, then it's her problem. One of the great joys of being a priest is to be able to celebrate the sacraments for your own family, family weddings and baptisms, first communions, and even funerals, which are such important moments in the life of a family. A few years ago, I had the joy of celebrating the, the wedding of my nephew, Tom O'Malley, Tom was adopted by, by my brother Ted and his wife Sue. He's from Mexico. He has jet black hair and very dark skin. 
When he's introduced as an O'Malley, it always causes a double take. <laughs> I tell people that the freckles ran together. <laughs> His wedding, for me, was such a moving experience. When I saw him so happy and with his lovely bride and the bride's sister, Diana, who was the maid of honor, I was so moved. Diana has Down syndrome. She was radiant. She exuded joy and excitement as she walked down the aisle in her beautiful gown. The adopted child who was the groom and the maid of honor who has Down syndrome were part of this extraordinary celebration because their mothers had the courage and the generosity to say yes to life. We know that an estimated 90% of all women who receive a prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome choose to abort their child. In addition, less than 1% of women with an unwanted pregnancy opt to place their child in an adoptive family. That translates into almost 100 abortions for every adoption. One of the greatest challenges before us is to change women's perception of adoption as being a bad choice. I often point to the story of King Solomon, who one day was called upon to settle a dispute between two women who claimed to be the mother of the same baby. At one point, the wise king asked for a sword and offered to cut the baby in two. Immediately, the real mother shouted, no, and gave the baby to the other woman. Sometimes being a real mother means entrusting your child to someone else so that the child will live. Paul Swope, in his much studied article in First Things, Abortion, a Failure to Communicate, attempts to answer that question that baffles pro-life activists. How can women and the public in general simultaneously hold that abortion is killing and that abortion should be legal. The Vitae Caring Foundation produced a study with the intriguing name, The Least of Three Evils, Understanding the Psychological Dynamics of How Women Feel About Abortion. The report shows that unplanned motherhood is often seen as a greater evil than abortion. An unwanted pregnancy is perceived as equivalent to death of self, a loss of control over one's present and future. And given that perspective, the choice of abortion becomes a lesser evil, a choice of self-preservation, a much more defensible position both to the woman and those supporting her decision to abort. Tragically, Adoption is seen as the most evil of the three options. It's perceived as a kind of double death. First, the death of self by carrying a baby to term. And second, death perceived by the woman is the death of a child through abandonment. A woman worries about her child being mistreated, abused, or neglected. She would perceive herself as a bad mother, one who gave her child away to strangers. Basically, the woman desperately wants a sense of resolution to her crisis, and in her mind, adoption leaves the situation the most unresolved with uncertainty and guilt for as far as she can see. As much as we might like to see the slogan, adoption, not abortion, embraced by women facing an unwanted pregnancy, studies suggest that pitting adoption against abortion Adoption will be the hands-down loser. In fact, why abortion is seen as something evil, the woman who is making that choice is seen as courageous, making a difficult but necessary decision. The study goes on to show that abortion is considered the least of the three evils because it's perceived as offering the greatest hope to a woman to preserve her sense of self. And this is why so many women deeply resent our pro-life movement, which they perceive as uncaring and judgmental. 
we have consistently focused on the safety of the unborn child, while the pro-abortion activists focus on the woman in crisis. With almost 100 abortions for every adoption, we have so much work to do. Obviously, we must never abandon our commitment to the unborn child, a precious human being made in the image and likeness of God. But we must learn to focus more on the woman in crisis. We must listen with empathy to be able to communicate the gospel of life. Pregnancy Crisis Centers, Project Rachel, and an aggressive advertising campaign that communicates greater understanding of the situation of women facing an unwanted pregnancy are of paramount importance. The media can be such a powerful tool in communicating a pro-life message. The Vitae Foundation has had amazing results with their television advertising that has increased pro-life sentiments among the general population in the areas where their pro-life ads appeared. We must never lose sight of the fact that we must work to change the laws, to overturn Roe versus Wade, but we must But we must work even harder to change people's hearts to help Americans understand that abortion is evil and it is unnecessary. <laughs> Spielberg's film Lincoln shows the monumental struggle against slavery and Lincoln's resolve to pass the 13th Amendment. But the law was only part of the struggle. The evil of racism, racism perdured for a century in civil rights legislation and the sacrifices of so many are contemporary realities in an ongoing struggle to live the ideals of our country. Changing hearts is always the hardest part. The laws will change. Hearts are harder to change. We must never tire of clarifying misunderstandings and shedding light where there is myth and confusion, demonstrating empathy and compassion and a deeper vision. That's the method being presented by Catholic Voices. It's not just the lucidity of our arguments, it's about the effect that our words have on others. Our task is to present the truth with civility, empathy, and clarity. Being champions of the gospel of life is about building a civilization of love. The new evangelization is really about changing hearts. It begins with our own heart, with our own conversion. Tomorrow, the day for the March of Life, is fittingly the feast of the conversion of St. Paul. His conversion was a great surprise that God had in, support, in store for the church, like the conversion of Dr. Bernard Nathanson, one of the founders of the pro-abortion movement who became a Catholic pro-life activist. To be able to carry out the mission that Christ has given us we need to be better people. We need to grow in faith and to witness Christ's love by our service to the poor and the suffering, and especially to women experiencing a challenging pregnancy. Gandhi once said, Gandhi once said that he would have become a Christian if he had ever known one. It's a shame he didn't live long enough to meet Mother Teresa of Calcutta. This year of faith is a call to a deeper conversion, 
so that we can become effective apostles of the gospel of life in the new evangelization. I often share with people once I was invited to a state dinner at the White House. The president of Brazil was here, and the White House wanted a Portuguese-speaking bishop to attend. Needless to say, they were very surprised when an O'Malley showed up. <laughs> they sat me between President Bush Sr., whom I recognized, and a lovely young lady who introduced herself as Gloria Estefan. When I asked her if she worked in the White House, <laughs> she informed me that she was a famous singer. I said, you obviously don't sing Gregorian chant. <laughs> I hope she wasn't offended. I suspect she understood that a friar wouldn't necessarily know who all the stars are. Our culture, on the other hand, is addicted to entertainment and lionizes celebrities. For us, the real celebrities are the saints. The world needs saints and heroes to help us glimpse God's holiness and beauty. Today we recall the pro-life saints and heroes like Blessed Mother Teresa, Saint Gianna Barreto Mola, Blessed John Paul II, and our own darling Nellie Gray. John Paul II, the true hero of the gospel of life, once said, that if faith does not become culture, it's a faith that is not fully accepted, not intensely conceived, not faithfully lived. Our task is to live our faith so intensely that we will generate a culture of life, a society that welcomes the weak and the poor and makes a place for every child at the table of life where people are more important than money, where the sick and the dying are cherished and cared for. Today's gospel... <clears throat> Today's gospel gives us the very first beatitude on the lips of Elizabeth. Blessed are you because you believe. Faith brought blessedness, joy, and peace to the heart of Mary, the woman of faith. May this year of faith, a gift from our beloved Holy Father, Benedict XVI, be a time of growth in faith and love, a deepening of our personal conversion, and a renewed sense of our mission to be witnesses of the gospel of life. And like John the Baptist in his mother's womb, may we jump for joy each day to be in the presence of the God of life, making clear to the world that our faith is about joy, love, service to others, and building a culture of life. <clears throat>